So each of us has a unique personality, right? How you're wired may be slightly different from how that person next to you is wired and how they're wired may be a little different from how the person next to them is wired and so on and so forth. But you know, across the human family, there do seem to be patterns, ways that our personalities can be similar or grouped together. One tool that many people, including many religious people, have found helpful in understanding those personality patterns is the Enneagram. For many folks, the Enneagram can help us to understand our motivations, our fears, and our values. But can the Enneagram also help us to understand our preference for board games? In a previous episode, we took a dive into the first half of the Enneagram, and on this episode, it's Enneagram Part 2. In this edition of Board Game Faith, the bi-weekly show exploring the intersection of religion, spirituality, and board games. Hello and welcome everybody to Board Game Faith. It is so good to have you here and joining us for this episode. My name is Daniel Hilty. And my name is Kevin Taylor. And to all of you, uh, we want to thank you for uh, taking a moment to, to share a part of your day with us. And, uh, and, and it is good to have you here. And Kevin, it's good to have you here. How you're, you're, you look like you're feeling better, like you're recovering from some of the, the viruses that I know is kind of going around your, your home. How are you all feeling now? We've been, we decided to visit uh, Virus City. Oh, no. And because we had bought a package, we kind of had to stay the whole time. Oh, no. But thankfully, we are now exiting Virus City, come oh. along. Wasn't that a Prince song? Come to city, come along. Virus City, Something come along. Something about a city? Virus Maybe? City? Maybe? I think that's Prince. But anywho, yeah, yeah, we are, um, we're on the mend, so thanks, yes. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. That, I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad that you it's were able to COVID, get out of the package it's not deal. not flu. Yeah, and it's not RSV. Okay. And it's not NIV. <laughs> <laughs> is it the KJV? Sorry, it's a Christian Bible. It's a, it's a Christian Bible. <laughs> Acronyms. Acronym City. Yeah. Anyway. Well, good. Good. I, I'm I'm glad that you're out of uh, Virus Town. Yes. Um, that's not a fun town to visit or to get a package deal in or to but even occasionally to have it a just, timeshare. You know. You know, it, it's like someone shows up and just takes you there. You, they put you in witness relocation program, and you kind of have to just play along for a while till you escape. Yeah, yeah. Um, Won't you take me to happens. Funky Town? Funky Town. Is that the song you were Funky thinking of? Funky Town. Won't you take no. me to Virus Town? Yeah, the city no. come up. Maybe it is. Maybe I, just I don't remember know. that bit like a very bass voice going, Dumb city come around. <laughs> it's I like probably it. from Bach. I think it might be Bach or Beethoven. A lot of people confuse Prince and Bach. It's they're 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 similar. They're, they're they're similar in a lot of ways. Yeah, I I love it. I love it. I yeah. that's great. The only reason you, Bach didn't sue Prince for for uh, you know stealing his songs is that A was dead and B um, the patent number had expired. So. The copyright. Other yeah, than yeah, that, yeah. it was yeah. total rip off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, whenever we we hear viruses in our family, at least for Kristen and me, the thing that it always reminds us of is a. Uh, this shows how how old we are, but years ago there was a Saturday Night Live skit where they were doing a, like a, a fake commercial for a rock festival, and uh, you know like like this Sunday out at the park it's you know extreme rock or whatever, and they were just and like the the um, the commercial was just kind of poking fun at how extreme the rock festival tried to to make it, and it's so <laughs> at some point. They advertise that there are airplanes that fly over the rock festival and like drop viruses on everybody. <laughs> and, 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 and the line was, we're going to spray you with viruses, yo. <laughs> so, so what do we hear that? So that's kind of our thing now. We're, yeah. we're going to spray you with viruses. Yo, is the, is the, anyway, how much so do you I, really want to rock? That's do you want right. to rock while you're sick. That's right. That's right. Well, anyway, I'm glad you all are better, and and I hope I hope our listeners are uh, are 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 healthy and well too, and and our viewers. Some of us may be watching the show on on YouTube, and mm -hmm. anyway, however you are consuming 
uh, this media. We we hope that you are healthy and happy and well. Eat oh. me, Seymour. <laughs> no, feed me. It's feed me, feed me, Seymour. <laughs> little, little shop of horrors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. consuming us. That's right. That's right. So today, Kevin, we're talking about part two of Enneagram. And why, why is this part two of Enneagram? Because we did a prior episode and we did a bit of history and overview. And we would encourage listeners and viewers to check that out, uh, search it, or I'll put a link on YouTube right above here for that prior episode. And um, yeah, check that out. So we won't rehash all of that, correct? We'll just give a real quick overview. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's exactly right. We hope um, you will check out the previous episode where we go more into a deep dive in terms of the background of the Enneagram, but, but in terms of the Enneagram in, in a nutshell, like in a, in a, in a, in, in a tiny, tiny nutshell, what would that, what would you say, Kevin, what's the people who are it unfamiliar is with a, Enneagrams? It, it's a nine. So the word itself means nine, really nine writing, gram, telegram, right? So Enneagram, so that just refers to nine personality types and there are various claims about the origins that are somewhat unclear. The time we really see it prevalent is in the 1970s. So it is kind of recent to, to thinking, but it's very popular in Christian and psychological therapeutic settings. Is that fair? It's a, it's yeah, a good way absolutely. to start. Yeah. And the idea is that everyone kind of falls into one of these types, but of course there's variation and you can lean towards others as well. So there's a bit of messiness. And if you are interested in knowing your Enneagram, there's, a, there's many websites you can go to and books you can read about and podcasts develop, uh, dedicated to it. But one we would probably send you to is yourenneagramcoach.com, yourenneagramcoach.com, Y-O-U-R. And yeah. that's a free, you know, they'll, they'll encourage you to make an appointment with them, but you don't have to. Just sign up, take the exam, and get your results. Right, right. And, and we're not fail. in no way... That's right. And we're yeah. in no way like partnered with your Enneagram code.com. Like this isn't I mean, an advertisement or anything for them. A hundred dollar bill, but I'm, oh. I'm not going to disclose uh, that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I take hundred did not denarius, which I think I can use. <laughs> no, we are not affiliated with them at no, all. No, no, no. And Enneagram for folks who may be wondering how to spell that it's, it's E N N E A G R A M E N N E A G R A M. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, like just a, a way telegram. of. That's right. That's right. Without Tella. With without any. Tella and with any in the front. Not spelled A-N-Y, but E-N-N-E. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this there idea... Was Audi, there was an audi -gram at one point, but it There was an audi -gram. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But it only... It was... It, no one liked it. It was... No one liked it. That's right. So, it's um, gross. Just so gross. there was... Uh, so it's basically this idea that, that there are nine personality types. That's right. Um, and... Uh, and, um, and, and most of us kind of fit into one of those, just a way of understanding fears, motivations, personality. So, yeah. So Kevin, mm -hmm. what, what are, what are some of the, what's the first half of the, of the different nine personality types in the Enneagram? Yeah. Just real briefly, I'll do the first four because yeah. there's nine and you can do the last five, but, uh, the number one is perfectionist. Someone who wants it done rightly and they're moral, they avoid blame. That is me. Yeah, I want it done correctly, and I don't like being. Uh, well, no one likes being blamed, but yeah, I, I kind of I like to follow the rules. I'm a perfectionist. Number two is the helper, someone who wants to be loved and needed, and often avoids their own needs. So they they really take pleasure in uh, being loved and needed by others. Number three is a performer, someone who wants success and wants to win and avoids failure. So someone who might want to be on television, for example, or, or in front of others. And number four, and of course, this is about lot, so just listen to these, and you can always Google it later if you're driving, etc. cetera. Uh, don't worry about writing these down. Just get a sense of them. But number four is the romantic need to be extraordinary and understood and avoid being ordinary. So the person that's going to really wear the pink tuxedo to the prom and desperately hope that everyone thinks it's awesome. You got it. They, I, I they're going to be different. We I think our middle people. child is a bit of that. Nice. Nice. That's <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. And then number five is the investigator, sometimes called the observer. This is someone who who really just likes to kind of often work independently, largely independently, doesn't like a lot of help from others, just to to um, observe and understand the world around them. Um, often kind of seen in conjunction with kind of a kind of a especially focused kind of scientific uh, worldview. Number six, the loyalist, sometimes uh, called the questioner. Um, they um, very much um, value security and safety. Um, can kind of maybe the shadow side is maybe can can catastrophize catastrophize that's the word mm -hmm. uh, things it is but can also be very committed and and loyal and funny uh, the enthusiast is number seven sometimes called the adventurer they just like to have a good time right and uh, they're fun and they're happy and avoid um, kind of the the negative harder things of life can you tend want the to. enthusiast at your party that's right that's right they're going to be the life of the party. There's no party until the enthusiast arrives. The perfectionists um, are just over there cleaning things. Yeah, it's really That's sad. right. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, the challenger uh, is number eight. Um, they like to uh, value strength and, um, and can sometimes kind of be confrontational or commanding, uh, avoiding weaknesses. Avoiding weaknesses is, is, um, is, is, can be a part of that personality. And then number nine is the, the, peacemaker which is often seen as kind of very accommodating um, um avoiding conflict as we shared in the last time you're number one uh kevin both in enneagram and in life mm. but then um i <laughs> but then i'm number nine <laughs> <laughs> kevin's number one he's number one and then i'm no, and, and i'm number nine on the personality type i'm the peacemaker uh just in, in terms of like, I just, I really, uh, um, I just value um, bridge building between different groups mm -hmm. and different people. And that, that gives my heart joy. And, uh, and, and then the flip side is kind of like nothing annoys me more than when people don't get along. It's right. like, it's like, Which come might on. Be life. Why you're attracted to board games. Cause they're a great way to bring people together. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Probably the best way to bring people together. Yeah. 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 In terms That's of right. health. Yeah, it's like a good, healthy way to connect. Yeah, awesome. So thank you. And then uh, one thing we it, just a couple caveats we haven't said yet, but we said this the last time. Just say it again this time. Kevin and I are not experts on this, as Kevin mentioned earlier. There are a lot of other podcasts and books and dedicated to the Enneagram. People who know a lot more about this than we do. So we're we're no experts. Please don't take our words on about any of this as authoritative. But we're just kind of having fun with the ideas and exploring what they might mean for board games and spirituality. And then finally, and, and, kind of, yeah, go ahead. And just comment too, pat on the back here, Daniel. I don't know that anyone else has ever done this. So no, if, if no. we're wrong, let us know in the comments or email us uh, boardgamefaith at, at uh, gmail.com. That's right. Uh, but That's as right. far as we know, like using the Enneagram related to board games is kind of, you know, this, this is, this is an This is a board game faith innovation, so I, I'm proud of that. I'm, cool. I'm I'm grateful to get to be sharing in it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think this is pretty cool. I'm grateful for for you and for the listeners and going on this this journey with us on it. Um, and and also yeah, just also just to say, you know, no system is perfect. We talked about this at the beginning. Um, whoever you are, you are more than a number. You're more than a number on a, on a, on a chart or a personality type test. So please just know that, but this is just maybe yeah. ways of roughly sketching some things that may be helpful in terms of understanding our personalities. But if it's not helpful, it is not, it is not the uh, be all and end all of everything. Just let it go. So anyway, right. that's, I think that's yeah. a great point. I think the goal of it is self acceptance and self awareness yeah that yeah. you understand what is helpful to you and what is not. And so you can hopefully build a life that is oriented towards that. I mean, you're going to still have to pay your taxes and mow your grass. So you're, you can't, none of us can live the life we exactly want, but you can shape the parts that you can according to what gives you joy and energy and avoid the things that, you know, will just 
ruin your short time here on earth. So yeah. I think the takeaway is to be self-aware, but also aware of others that sometimes when people yeah. do things, it's not because they don't like us or they're intentionally trying to upset us. It's that it's something that's really difficult for them because yeah. of their personality type. And so that helps you understand where other people are coming from. And it's, yeah. I think that's such Go a ahead. great point, Kevin. Yeah, no, I just, I agree. I, it reminds me of, I think a lifelong struggle I've had in trying to understand what we call the, um, you know, the golden rule in the Christian tradition. Um, uh, but other religions have other forms of it as well. And, um, you know, the sense of, you know, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, you know, um, mm. and that Ooh. I, for the longest time, and 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 still today, I I fall back into this. I, I'm in, I'm I'm so far from having a, a a complete grasp of this. But for the longest time, I just assumed that other people were wired the same way that I was, and so I, I thought if I liked something, then for me to treat others the way that I want to be treated means that I I play into that. You know, so like if I like playing really heavy board games or whatever, then surely oh, this person was true or whatever, you know? And, and it occurred to me, I mean, it's nothing original to me from others, but the sense that really it, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you doesn't mean assuming that they're wired the same way that you are. What, what it, as I've maybe I'm trying to learn to, to understand it, what it means is first you got to understand how that person is wired. Right. And, and just mm -hmm. as you would want someone to take the time to get to know, as I would want someone to take the time to get to know how I'm wired and what fits well with my wiring doing unto others as I would, I would have them do to me means I need to take the time to get to know how they're wired and to care enough to do what, what appeals to, to their wiring. Right. And not to mine. Does that sort of make, I, 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 no, I hear you saying so that. Deep. I, I, we're going off script here, but I never <laughs> thought of applying the, the idea of the golden rule uh, to the Enneagram. But you're right. In some ways it, 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 raises a real question to the golden rule, which is, can you really do unto others what you want done unto you? Uh, because people are wired differently. So yeah, I, I like that, that what we'd want to do is for people to understand us on some level and respect our differences. And it makes me think too, maybe the golden rule is really about the moral law. So it, it, it's not supposed to function in terms of how we flourish. It's just saying, okay, if you want to avoid sin and evil, do you want to be stolen from? No. Well, then don't steal from others. Mm, so it's really mm. a way to encapsulate our moral relationships. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. To flourish, we really have to think a little differently, which I is see, not just morality, but but how to live our best life. Mm. I don't know if that's a moral issue. So maybe the golden rule is more about restricting behavior, maybe. And, yeah, well, or just how I, I like to get along that. without. Right, yeah, right. I'd have to think more about it, but. But we don't typically use the golden rule as a, t as a basis for spirituality, do we? I guess you could, but it's really more I about. Know. Yeah. God, you know, I think about also weird. about in terms of like someone told me the other day, um, uh, a Jewel who sometimes listened to this, this podcast, you know, she was talking about um, this idea, you know, they all have this idea of different love languages, right? That there are different ways mm -hmm. that how I feel loved, what makes me feel loved is different from how it makes someone else feel loved. And, and, um, and yeah, it's almost a variation of the Enneagram. Yeah. 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 Some so, level. you know, so like if one person feels loved by getting a lot of hugs, you know, or things like that, but someone else, but you assume that's how the, how everyone likes to feel loved. Some people are going to give them a hug and they're going to say, Hey, that's really much too touchy feely, right? You're kind of right. It, it, you're kind of encroaching my personal space and my boundaries. I don't feel loved. I feel vulnerable. I feel attacked. You know, and, and unsafe. And so it it means taking the time to really get to know that person's heart and how they're wired. There isn't good or bad. There's just different ways of being wired and getting mm -hmm. to know and care enough about another person to understand what love means for them, right? How how they. Does that, yeah, I think we're all saying, we're just saying the same thing again and again. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. And you know, I've, I've, I've seen this in real life, IRL, and you know, I'm sure you've seen it too. At the end of a church service, if you are a pastor, typically you go, some, some 
place in the sanctuary or out, outside the doors and people greet you afterwards. It's just kind of a... Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's one of those things you think about later, like, I don't know why we do that, but we do. Right, um, right. And some people are going to slip out through other exits, so it's yeah. not mandatory or anything. But, but I've noticed that what you're saying, that some people really want to hug and they're going to be offended if I don't hug them. And other yep. people don't want to be touched. And it's really tricky to understand how to <sighs> interact with people. Yeah, uh, whether you yep. shake their hands or, you know, yeah, it, it's a, it's a weird dance. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Some are offended if you don't hug them, and some are offended if you do hug them. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. and yeah, it's yeah. um, yeah. probably where I got this virus. But <laughs> <laughs> so on the first episode about the enneagram, we did enneagram numbers nine through four because it's a circle. So we just went nine, one, two, three, four. But um, today we're looking at numbers five through eight. And the first one we're looking at is number five, kind of the investigator or the observer. And Kevin, what are your thoughts on, on oh, that? This is so interesting. This personality type makes me think of someone who's really a scholar, like someone who's going to be really happy studying, writing books, researching. And so their games are probably going to be similar to that. And yeah. so uh, that would be a game where you get to learn or, or reveal something. So there's several games and you this is one that uh, you and i had mentioned the search for planet x is a great, yes. oh, such a good mm. game and that is a exactly great game. a game where you are uh, trying to figure out clues it's really a, a puzzle in a lot of ways a race to the puzzle it's a puzzle with a timer yeah and yeah. it's just really well done and so that would be an investigator observer type might be kind of a choose your own adventure type story oh um, yeah it makes me yeah. think of sherlock holmes consulting detective which oh, I've never played that. Those. Yeah, how you is know, it? I did not like it. I have really? to admit, mm. uh, it's such a cool concept, and and lots of people love it. So it may just—I'm sure it's just me—but you get a box of clues, like newspaper clippings, and you're yeah. supposed to figure out what's happened. But there's very much a gotcha element in this game. I find that mm -hmm. I dislike in any game, which is, well, if you'd gone left, and you'd figured out this is a red herring you would have won. Mm, but because mm. you went right, or you believe this other person based on randomness, then you lost. Mm, mm. You're basically trying to beat Sherlock Holmes and how many steps it takes you to figure out who did it. Okay. And um, okay. I find that really frustrating. Huh. It feels very arbitrary. Mm, interesting. Yeah. But some people really that. love it. And I can see in a group setting, you know, discussing the theories could be really fun. And maybe if, if you were a, ty a Enneagram five, you might, might enjoy it more maybe in terms of maybe that's the you might yeah you might. yeah but i like that yeah you? so so games about like so what i hear you saying is kind of like yeah games especially about like logic and deduction right like here are mm -hmm. the here are the the uh, pieces of evidence here are the pieces of data that we have and then what can we conclude from it what you know mm -hmm. who, who is the murderer or search for planet x is the same way you get certain clues and right. you're trying to figure out where this hidden planet is in the night sky or in the you know in the in the galaxy yeah i agree it, and it, um another great logic deduction game that our family likes is called cryptid it's a really it's similar to search for planet x in a lot of ways but you've got this map and you have certain clues about a cryptid about a kind of a mythical creature where they live in this habitat and you're trying to use your deductive skills to figure out the actual um, location of the of this cryptid this this mythical animal on the landscape mm -hmm. um and um, yeah oh, oh chronicles of crime occurred to me as well kind of and it's another that looks again, fun is that good is that a good one yeah you know um it is fun i can see what people like it i have to and maybe this is because i'm not a personality type number five i have to admit i i just I didn't quite get into it as much. I um, hmm. mainly because I thought I was really bad at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was really bad at it, and again, maybe it goes back to personality type. But uh, we'd get all these pieces of data, and uh, I just couldn't string them together to form the conclusion right. you that know, the game wanted me to my form. Problem too. Yeah, yeah. I can't string it together, and you're supposed to figure out somebody's lying, but how do you know? You're just right. it's right. intuition, maybe, because you don't catch them. You might catch them in a lie in something, but in yeah. some games, I mean, maybe yeah, there's a yeah. way, but in general, you just have to kind of guess. Yeah, yeah. Huh. 
Yeah, I've thought about that. Um, we we had Detective City of Angels. Oh yeah, I wanted to try that. And that How... our family is really like that, and because okay. that one's a little goofier. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's a bit of that what we're saying, string along and guess, but because there's an element of a there's sort of a game master and some and others racing, but kind of messing with each other. We found it really fun. I don't Neat. mind at the end that I lost because you just have a good experience because it's kind of like you can go shake down the casino for the mob and stuff. So are I, there are only a goofy. certain set number of cases in that game. There are, there's like five. Okay. I think okay. So. I, I, I don't know why I'm giving a number. I don't remember. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> no, that's fine. It feels like five. But yeah. there are expansions, yeah. which I've almost bought, because that's one game that our family really has enjoyed playing together. Neat. Because our middle child is just so funny as the GM or DM or whatever, game master. <clears throat> so, yeah, that kind of game would work. Even Sleeping Gods might work because you're investigating mm -hmm. a storyline and following a plot. It's kind of a yeah, choose yeah. your own adventure type experience. So it's not so much getting the right answer as deducting through what might have happened or way a path you're finding pathways right right yeah. and those are also great for solo so investigator oh, okay. observer may be into a group setting or it may uh, i think it's often described as independent and private so they may really like solo games oh solo gaming yeah that's a and great Sleeping idea gods is really very much a well i mean it can be co-op but it, it it it's it's a solo game that could be co-op yeah and if you're into solo games, as an investigator, a personality type number five in the Enneagram, or an observer, I, I feel compelled to mention two lines, well, one line specifically of solo gaming that I just adore is the, uh, I think they call it the, the Oni universe, but it's, it started with Oniram. Mm. Um, and then there, are, there have been many sequels, several sequels to it, and all of those games are just fantastic solo games just small box one of them games. and yeah it is a yeah. great little game yeah 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 cool. i love the art cool. yes the i do opens too. up in a cool way like <sighs> oh i the know box is i know a part of the experience yeah they just came out with a new one last year in, in that series huh. i um yeah i went check out i forget the I name of it the fire one oh yeah yeah i don't have that one. one okay cool 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 so that's number five the investigator or the observer mm-hmm and number six is the uh, the loyalist or the questioner. The loyalist or the questioner. Um, so yeah, so th th these are folks um, that uh, that especially you know um, I, I mentioned we mentioned at the beginning kind of like safety, security, um, kind of value that especially, but but like being able to weigh to kind of especially. Um, communicate their ways into that and communicate maybe their ways um, deeper into a, a sense of safety and security. And, and on the flip side, maybe kind of can tend to uh, catastrophize things as well. And I have to admit, I, I, I struggled a little bit, especially with trying to come up with game possibilities for number six, the loyalist or the questioner. Mm. Um, but I wondered whether, um, I, I wondered whether negotiation games might be might okay. be something that a, a questioner or a loyalist might like because negotiation games are very much about you ex asserting your agency, uh, using your communication and negotiation skills to sec get yourself to a secure position, right? To, to try to, um, it's not based on luck or it, it's based on how you can navigate your environment and your, and your interaction with other players to, um, to get in a good place for yourself. And so that's why, so I thought about maybe negotiation games, especially like Bonanza, mm -hmm. um, which is spelled with an H, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the B-O-H-N-A-N-Z-A. Um, it is, um, I, I would I would, I would, would go out on a limb here and I would say it's uh, um, arguably the, uh, the definitive um, card-based bean farming game. <laughs> Are you um, sure? Because that seems not, to be a very um, I, generalized statement. You know, I, I will uh, I, I will die on that hill. This this is the definitive 
card based bean farming game. <laughs> it is a great game. Um, I'm so terrible at it. I, I, I don't understand why. I, I, there's there's something. There's a synapse in my brain that just always loses at this game. But it's it is a great game. Yeah, I do too. It's one of the yeah. best card games ever. Let's be honest. It is. It's really and it, Uwe Rosenberg's very first <clears throat> game for those of really yeah. Um, some of our listeners may know Uwe Rosenberg is a very famous board game designer. Has gone on to to design a lot of super popular games and pretty heavy games. But his very first game, as I understand it, was this, it's still complicated, but, but lighter card game about bean farming, Mm -hmm. um, Bonanza. Um, and then there are some other, you know, negotiation games that I think of, um, Chinatown is another great negotiation game. Um, um, so, um, anyway, just, those are some, uh, but I don't know. Does that? What do you think, Kevin? About this idea of? Do you yeah, think it makes the loyalist questioner would like. Yeah, I think they'd love a co-op game. So maybe like Pandemic, mm, mm, where you, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you you're trying to stay secure and you make decisions together. So the loyalist mm, probably mm. would. Well, they might be okay with an alpha gamer because part of it is, as I take it, is is kind of unity in some ways. Mm-hmm. They want, they desire security. So, you know, they're going to trust the alpha gamer to hopefully get them through the game and cause they want to win. I yeah. Assume. Yeah. Um, but that would be a great one. Uh, in any, so any co-op game where you're working together to avoid losing or dangerous situations. Uh, so any of the pandemic games would be great. Um, uh, Nemesis is a great game where you're kind of, crouching your way through a, a spaceship with alien monsters so that that it might actually drive them a little crazy because it's it's too much where you're you can die and get infected mm-hmm. and and even be eliminated from the game and so that i think a, a loyalist would really hate that i wonder as you're talking i wonder also whether maybe a game that six personality type loyalist or question might enjoy would be kind of those very gentle games without win or lose conditions, but just games where you're trying to see how well you can do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then there's kind of not that, that insecure feeling of, Oh no, am I going to win or lose the game? You know, but, um, but more gentle, like I I think, I think there's a game called gentle rain that I've never played, but I've heard Mm -hmm. is, is is a game very much like that. Um, um, Right. I I like it. So you're beating your score, but you're not going to really lose. Some right, high stakes. Yeah, I think you may be right. Um, um, they might be good at dice mitigation type games where you ha- you do want to catastrophize because mm. you have to prepare for the worst case, which is mm. if you roll a one, you lose the game on this roll. So mm. there are some games that allow you to mitigate the risk, which is interesting. Like uh, Final Girl in some ways has That's that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. to prepare for how to win. And so they might actually be really good at that. Okay. Because I tend to be That's a little a impulsive. So I'm like, oh, we're going to win it. And then you're like, you're all the one. You're like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I oh, just no. think if I just slow down, slow down, Kevin, slow down. But I get excited. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Well, that's number, number seven. six. Yeah, so what's yeah. number seven, Kevin? Number seven is Seven Kevin. It's a, it's a nice <laughs> rhyme. I like it. Uh, Seven Kevin says, Seven is the enthusiast, fun and happy and enjoy pain. So um, this is the, they're going to like party games, right? They're yeah, going to yeah. enjoy things that really build a lot of energy in the room that are going to get people laughing. Um, and games are great because they're not necessarily painful. Mm-hmm. Unless it's a game with player elimination. But most other games... If you're playing, say, Telestrations, what's the worst thing that happens? You draw a bad picture and everyone laughs. That's right, which is actually the like best thing that could happen. Which is the best. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there really yeah. is very little pain. If the, if everyone's having fun, there is no pain in the game. Yeah. If you're yeah. bored or you got eliminated or it's too hard. So they're going to enjoy games that are a bit lighter maybe that can be f- unintentionally funny or intentionally funny mm-hmm. like Telestrations mm-hmm. or maybe code names. Like, like no, a, I meant the blue one, and everyone laughs, you know. That, yeah, that yeah. might be a good one for them. Um, so party-type games is what I'm thinking. Uh, party what games are, your are great. Those are, that's, party games are great, a great um, mm-hmm. oh, recommendation. Of, we did this at church. Well, the, the, the women's group did this 
for their Christmas party, and then we did it with the kids. There's a really funny game someone found social media where you blindfold someone, and they yeah. have a bowl, like a big punch bowl, like a very yeah. large bowl, and they have a spatula. Oh. And you cover the table with little ribbons like you put on gifts, Christmas gifts and others that you stick on. Yeah. And for, in one minute, they have to see how many they can scoop into the bowl. Oh, that sounds fun. And they're blindfolded. And then the spatula is flat, right? So you have to yeah. kind of get in and then they're falling off and you have... So everyone else is watching them basically shovel air. <laughs> <laughs> That's laughing. really funny. Yeah, it was really cute to watch people do uh, that. And then that some sounds... people got pranked. Like they took all the ribbons off the table and so they actually never got any. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, no. That sounds no, fun. It was, I mean, it's goofy. So that, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of game was really... Uh, yeah, remember that one next year for Christmas. I like it. I like it. They were, they were, fun. people were just, just, you know, hooting and hollering. They were having so much fun. Because like it's that. intentionally like embarrassing because you're, you can't see what you're doing, which right. makes it right. safe because there is no yeah. pain. Yeah. No one could, can fault themselves <clears throat> or say, I'm an awful person for, yeah. Not well, like getting... the illustrations, it's actually more fun if right. you're failing. <laughs> right. <laughs> the right. beautiful thing. Right. Because right. then everyone's laughing harder. <sighs> Uh, that would be because, an interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, that's all. That's all. Th that would be an interesting topic for a future episode, Kevin. Like how, Ooh. how can games help us to make peace with failing or have fun with failing uh -huh. or uh -huh. embrace our limits and our failures and even delight in them or celebrate in them. Right. That would laugh at ourselves. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, just a thought. Yeah. No, I like it. As well as grow. I have to admit, I've kind of realized I've not always been a great gamer. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that I'm learning to get better at. I'm learning better strategy. So it also is a way to improve. Mm -hmm. If you embrace mm -hmm. the failure and say, okay, I lost. Why did I lose? I almost right. have a, you know, a, a post-mortem type thing. What can I of, learn from of, that? What can I learn from that? And yeah. then, you know, it's like you, you do get better. You're like, okay, if I, let me try this. And then you get better. That's yeah, a real thrill. Yeah. yeah. There's this, I mean, you've probably heard it. There's a famous R Rumi po poem. I, and mm. I forget the name of the poem, but Rumi, as some of our listeners may know, uh, is a, a Sufi, was a Sufi Muslim poet from the 13th century, I believe. And, um, a contemporary of St. Francis, by the way, which I thought was fascinating that these two people oh, wow. would exist at the same time because they're kind of like, they share a similar spirit in some ways, um, mm -hmm. but from very different religious traditions in very different parts of the world. Because Francis but, wrote, he wrote some poems too, in a sense, right? Like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the Canticle of the Sun and things. Yes, yes. I. Uh, it feels like the spirit of God was doing something beautiful in the world at that time. And also some... Mm -hmm. Uh, some awful things are going on in the in the world at that time too with the crusades and such but right. but anyway but rumi was is is this famous sufi muslim poet um uh from um i think i think he's from what is what is now afghanistan i think and this was mm. i don't quote me on that i'm sorry iran or what's now iran or afghanistan um anyway um but um and by the way did you know he's the 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 best-selling poet in the world, um, but we I did not know that. At least, at least he was, according to something I read a few years ago. Um, and More listeners, if you know differently, please correct us. Yeah, but like, we almost never hear about him in in the English-speaking world. But the, but the best-selling mm. poet in the world, hmm. anyway. But he has this poem where he talks about how everything that happens in life is sent to us as a guide, like a, a, a guide. And, and I think it makes me think about that. And you talk about ways of seeing our failure, you know, and failure in games or even failure in life, mm -hmm. that everything, everything can be seen as a guide or a teacher, you know, and what do we, right. what do we learn from this? How does it, how can it guide us? Anyway. Yes. Well, yeah. you know, in some ways this is, uh, we had an earlier conversation with Dave Bindewald and that was one of the things he works with, right? Mm -hmm. Is how, how to embrace failure. Yeah, freedom because to fail. Failures, yeah, free to fail, which because it means you tried something different, and it also yep. means you have an opportunity to learn and grow. Yep. And yep. and I think this is also in in Kate McGonigal's book, Reality Is Broken, mm. that mm -hmm. we need ways mm -hmm. to uh, fail and learn and grow in our lives and workplaces and things because it means yeah. we're um, we're trying something new. 
Yeah, yeah. And play, playfulness is certainly a great teacher for embracing our failure and, and not being afraid of it. Um, right. As we right. tend to kind of think of it as the worst thing in the world in our very kind of achievement oriented worldview, kind of our success, our success oriented worldview. That, yes. That, that's, yes. That's often nurtured in our corner of the world. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, well, cool. So next, number six, number what you so we did, we did seven already, didn't we? You no, did. We did um, seven. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, that brings us to number eight, our last Enneagram type that we are discussing uh, between last episode and this one, which is the asserter or the challenger, the asserter or the challenger. Um, and to me, it seems as if uh, someone who's a personality type eight, asserter or challenger, would especially like player elimination games. Right? It, it, um, you know, just games where uh, there is this kind of fun way of asserting oneself and saying... Um, uh, a, a fun way of confronting others, a fun way of asserting oneself and saying, here I am, you know, and, uh, and you're not, you know, or, or I'm, I, I'm kind of the last person standing. And so player elimination games, probably the most famous one, of course, is chess, uh, is, mm. is a classic player elimination game, but there are a lot of hobby board games that are player elimination. Um, personally, I don't get them quite as much, so I don't know a lot of them. But I, I know one that I enjoy that I've talked about is Strike. Strike is a dice player elimination game. And it's so fast. A game is over like in five to seven minutes. You don't mind. Even if you're not um, someone who likes those kind of games, you don't mind it because it's fun and it's done really quickly. It's, it seems very silly. Right. Um, but um, anyway, those are kind of my thoughts on personality type eight. If you're kind of an asserter or a challenger. Um how about you, Kevin? Any thoughts? Yeah, on I mean, games? eights are tricky. I think they are probably the alpha gamer, and so if mm -hmm. you're an eight, you need to watch out. Although at times you do need a little leadership, you need a little guidance. Um, so th there is a place and a time for an occasional eight to step up. I know one time we were playing Pandemic with someone, and we kind of told them not to do something that we'd probably lose the game, and then they did it anyway, and then we lost mm. the game. So it's kind of funny, but yeah. also you know, unpleasant. So it's one of those, <laughs> right, you know, right. do you just let us lose or do you step in? So um, yeah, eights yeah. have a certain strength and a real weakness in the sense that they can dominate a game and make people feel very, uh, like they don't have any autonomy or choices. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right that they're going to enjoy some player elimination or ways to be bold to, um, to kind of lead. So they might like a game that is a co-op that they can, be a leader, but hopefully not dominate too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the player elimination. I did think of Coup, which is such a great game. It is a mm. little frustrating to get eliminated. Yeah. But hopefully, yeah. if you play several hands, different people are getting eliminated, so it becomes it doesn't feel too personal, and it can right. still be fun to watch people bluff. So it's a bit like right. watching a poker game. Yeah. Just yeah. Sitting there wondering, or you can even yeah. maybe look at their cards and not say anything, just like sit behind them and watch them try to lie oh like what you've been eliminated you've yeah coup? yeah no oh, uh, yeah i think i tried it once i think i did try it once yeah yeah it's yeah. a great game um, yeah yeah it might it's, it's, it's sort it's, of like it's is it werewolf it. sort of like werewolf nope 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 nope, nope. this nope. one okay. is you get okay. two cards and they're they're, they're you, you use them to claim a certain power or condition okay and but you can lie. And then if someone calls you on it, then they lose one of their cards. They're also your life. So when you lose your two cards, you're out of the game. Okay, okay, So okay. you can say, I am the assassin and I'm going to kill Daniel's card. And then, But Daniel could say that he has a character that blocks the assassin. So you get bluffs within bluffs. So I it's see, really good with teenagers because they get to act out and be bold and then also fail. And then it can be kind of funny, like, okay, I wasn't the assassin. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, and so, and then you can tax and, and various, there, there's some coins that then can let you take certain actions. Uh, so, yeah, it's it just a fun. series of, what's that? It sounds fun. It really is, it really yeah. is. Um, it's kind of a one-trick pony. After you play it a few bits, you're probably ready to take a break, um, but, but it is a good game. So someone who, someone who's good at bluffing, 
Yeah, so yeah, number eights yeah. would probably be bluffers. Okay. So to be good okay. at poker or something. I like Don't it. Don't you think? Yeah, yeah, sort I like of that. Confrontational. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Show good. me show me your hand. Let's see who wins. The, uh, hearing you describe it makes me think a little bit of like um that very popular game Love Letter too, which may or may huh. not be but you know, basically you just have what, one or two cards in your hand at all the times and, and you know, that's I've not very, played it, but I know it's a very popular series, Love Letter. Yeah, and it involves a fair amount of bluffing. And there's, okay. you know, these different combinations where one card can eliminate the other or weaken the other or it's just yeah, yeah. What's cool. great with bluffing is when there's someone that you don't know is good at bluffing and they trick everyone. Uh, Especially yeah. sometimes it's a little kid. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some six year old just bluffed you out and then everyone dies laughing so i like those moments that's yeah that is great uh, or someone that you think is good at bluffing is actually not you're like oh i know you're lying yeah <laughs> and the other thing with coup is you have to remember what you bluffed mm. because you could be down mm. to one card and then you'd claim earlier that you were the the captain right right and then if you forget what you said and you try to change it then someone's like i know you're you know something's something's fishy here Anyway, uh, so that's, give it a try that's sometime. Enne- yeah, it's a good. So one that's too. the enneagram. A, that's the enneagram. Cool, cool. Well, we I I hope hopefully between this episode and last episode, um, folks who are listening or watching, hopefully you found some games that sounded interesting to you and maybe could fit well with um, kind of whatever your personality type might be. Um, uh, we. Uh, we certainly have had fun talking about them. So th- That's right. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's larger takeaways we could get from this, Daniel? Yeah. Think about these. As a, as yeah. A whole? I know we, that's something we had discussed earlier. I mean, I, I mean, um, I mean, I like what you were saying earlier, Kevin, just about this thought of, it's a reminder that, you know, we're all, different and it's not quite it's not fair to assume that the kind of joy and love that we're going to find in a certain kind of game is the is what someone else is going to feel and i don't know how how about but you said that better how would you say this or how would you talk about it in terms of your take takeaways from all this no i think you said it great that that trying to see what people enjoy and being aware if you want to play a game with them you may need to meet them where they are so if you simply want to play a game and you know type of person they are, then that may help you pick a game or suggest a game that will appeal to them. Yeah. Um, but, but expecting someone who is <clears throat> into maybe being impulsive or wants to make grand actions or wants to be, I'm looking back at the list here, something enthusiastic or a challenger, expecting them to play a three hour Euro game you know, why did you think that would be fun? Right, right. So if yeah. your goal is to have fun, you need to make choices. And I think we all know this on some level, but this might help you articulate what games you pick for which groups and understanding where people are coming from. Maybe you need house rules for a game yeah. to make it slightly different. And also you might think of your, your board game collection and experiences. Have you experienced all these types and which mm-hmm. ones are you missing? And maybe you like them more, maybe you'd like them more than you think you would. So maybe try some of these that you don't normally play or add them to your collection. If you don't have a bluffing game uh, and, and you want to, <clears throat> one thing that games are great as it gets, lets us try on new styles. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And that's, I think the theme of a book that we've not read yet, or I haven't read yet, uh, Games as Agency. Is that right? Mm. Or, uh, agent, uh, games, uh, Agency as Art. Yeah. Agency as Art. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's going to be one of our book club selections yeah. Uh, yeah. coming in 2024. So, yeah, if you don't normally bluff, game is a great time to try it out. And it's a great you may way be terrible to at it, or you may get better at it, or you may hate it, or you might actually really like it. Yeah, so yeah. It's a safe space to bluff because it's not real money. It's just a game. A great way to explore your personality, some maybe under-accessed part of your personality or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And it reminds me, hearing you talk also just reminds me of, you know, unless you're doing a solo game, um, games and play 
you know, are fundamentally a communal experience, you know, a community experience. And which means ultimately, you know, that it's not just about me, right? It's not just about Mm -hmm. what kind of game I like. It's not, and, and, and so playing with others, setting games with others can be an, an invitation to, or a guide as Ruby might say, um, to growing in compassion and understanding of the wiring and preferences of the hearts and minds of others mm-hmm. and seeing what connects with them. An opportunity to think about that in more meaningful ways than I might think usually as I'm going through my day, just kind of focused on my own stuff, you know? Right. Right. There's a bit of, there's always a bit of a negotiation in a game. You're, you're, allowing someone to a space and you're agreeing to follow certain rules and you may really want to have a cup of coffee, but you can't at the table cause you don't want to spill it on the game. So you're, you're, there's a bit of a negotiation in any gaming experience. Yeah. Somebody's going to yeah. take longer than you and at their turn. Um, yeah. so that's an opportunity to, to grow and be patient Yeah. yeah. or to say, you know, I'll never play this game again, which is t- totally fair. <laughs> it is. It is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I've got to get the game Destinies. I got several years ago. I thought I would like it, and I I don't know. I think I'm going to have to sell it. I just, Mm. it just just wasn't for you. I'm never going to play it. And it just kind of, I, 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 yeah, I need to just. Do you know why it wasn't for you? Can you, can you name that? Oh, I thought you were, no, I want you to tell me. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) I think it has that, you know, gotcha element of, well, if I'd gone left, then I could have achieved it. Okay, okay. And uh, I think with the right group, that's a D&D type group, it could be a lot of fun. Yeah. But I don't know that I enjoy it as a story. Yeah. yeah. As a solo story experience. It's not yeah. enough of a game. It's sort of trying to do a D&D experience as a game. And I'm not sure that works for me. But lots of people love it. I mean, they made yeah, a bunch of sequels. Sure. Have you tried for it? Sure. I, have, I, I, have it, I have it, too. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Um, I mean, and I... I liked it, but I have to admit I haven't. I've not played it a lot, um, okay. either. I, I I'm trying to think why I haven't returned to it. This may get a little bit to what you and I were talking about before we start recording, but I seem to be at a stage in life where I'm kind of gravitating more toward games that require less and less setup and less and less right investment of myself in terms of carrying through from one game to another, you know? Um, and, and I enjoyed the game destinies, but I, I guess for me, it, it felt like, especially with involving an app and things like that, there, there's a fair amount of things you have to do to set up a game experience. And then the, you know, it can be carryover set up from one game to another. And um, I think I've just, my heart and mind is just in a different place right now in terms of, yeah. Um, you know, we should, we should do a episode on like seasons of life mm, and seasons yeah. of gaming. Cause I think you're right. You, you, there's a, almost a lifespan of the gamer that you go from <clears throat> early on excitement. I mean, I used to dream about board games. I'd play something yeah. and then that night yeah. I was dreaming about it thinking yes. in my dream, yeah. I was trying to study the rules and now yeah. I, I don't yeah. do that as much and I'm a yeah. bit choosier yeah. and pickier or yeah. like yeah. you're saying, I want something that's just more approachable. Right. And right. less, yeah. less of a immersive experience. Yeah. yeah. So maybe, maybe we go through a spring, summer, winter, or wait, wait, hang on. Spring, summer, fall, winter experience. Yeah. I'd like that. That would be cool. We'll write it down. Yeah. Ecclesiastes, a, t- a season for everything. Ooh. Yeah. Everything. I'm yeah, excited for all... <clears throat> Go ahead. Excuse me. Just, I'm excited for a lot of different cool episodes coming up this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rest of 2024. For, for me, for Destinies, there was a point where there's, and I don't, I don't think this is a spoiler, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. But there's the, one of the figurines is like a large angel type thing, mm-hmm. and it got on the board, but we had to have something to keep it there, and like we didn't know where it was, and then within a couple of turns, it was gone, and I was just like, mm. how is I supposed to? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like there's no way mm-hmm. to know that I was supposed to have that. I don't think. Right. And so if I'd right. luckily gotten it, and so now I don't know what we missed out on. And I guess you could replay it, but I just, that's that gotcha bit of like, well, how was I supposed to know that? And maybe I'm just bad at it, but but I found that frustrating because I I, I want to know what was going to happen with the cool angel. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. And there was a fail failure condition, I guess, because it's a game, right? So there there has to be a win lose condition. Right. It's not but a cooperative it felt messy game. Feeling. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, I'm thinking of Bernard suits. Like there has to be a win condition, right. type thing. But um, yeah, I, I didn't find any hints for it. Like I didn't meet four people who are like, make sure you get the magic feather or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. So there's a timer in the game. Yeah, I think that's kind of maybe what I was saying earlier about Chronicles of Crime. Why I didn't maybe quite get into that mm. as much. I felt like you know, like mm -hmm. I missed, I missed a clue that the game. Yes. Like I re that I really needed to get in order to get the game, you know, to fit to to, to win the game. And, and maybe if you love that type of game, or if you're good at finding the clues, or it all works out in terms of timing, I bet it's really thrilling. Yeah. yeah. But but yeah, I find that it just doesn't work for me. Just based on personality types. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. And experiences, should, and maybe it's talk just bad luck that. with the experience. Yeah. 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 Interesting. All right. Uh, any special games over the holidays you want to mention? Um, yes, I was going to ask if maybe if I, if I wanted to share one one game we enjoyed over the holidays. I, I'll just share one. And I'll share some more maybe in the future. Um, for Christmas, I got a game called Switch and Signal, um, which was which I am really enjoying. It is unlike any other game we have. It is a cooperative game um, where you are trying to get um, uh, trains. Uh, to pick up goods from cities and then deliver them to the harbor, oh, and um, and I don't it's, and have it's, very many pick up and delivery games. So that's I cool. have just discovered that I really like pick up and delivery games. I think I'm about myself, and and huh. but but this is cooperative, so no one's winning or losing. You you, you either everyone win or everyone lose. You're trying to to get. Um, you know the trains to deliver all the goods in time before the game ends, but the, the the real mechanism of the game is switches and signals. You have to turn different switches and signals on and off throughout Europe to make sure the trains can get to where they're going and they don't run into each other and they don't hit each other and they're going in the right direction. And it's really fun. I like it. Very so switch and signal. Yeah, it's a very uh, puzzly. It's a cooperative puzzly game, but it's it's cool. fun. How about you? What's a game you played over the holidays that you liked? Uh, we played The Cat in the Box, mm. and that is a card trick-taking game, which I love trick-taking games. They're just, you know, it's like a, this theme that you people keep, I don't know, it seems to have a lot of different combos. I remember in college, we played a lot of spades and then yeah, cards, yeah. which is like a weird version of spades where you yeah, don't yeah, want to yeah. take tricks. So yeah. even back then with just a deck of cards in the, the 90s, we were having fun with trick-taking games. So um, that's a great game. <clears throat> uh, Cat in the Box was cool, especially because I read through the instructions. But that's the kind of game where I don't think you understand it till you play it a few times. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you realize how you can have a paradox, which is picking a card that doesn't exist in a sense. And uh, that just became really interesting. I, I, yeah, that's a great puzzly game. That's and we awesome. were, and that's... I was playing it with three other people, and none of us had played it before. And we all at the same time were like, huh. Yeah. We start realizing there's a, just a lot of depth to that game. Yeah. That's so you've awesome. played it as well. Awesome. I have. I have. Uh, and yes, I agree. It's, I loved it. I loved it. It's one of those games, I think, as you said, I love games like this, where when you read the instructions, you don't think it will work. But then you actually mm -hmm. play it. It's like, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, mm -hmm. I get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But just reading it, it's like, what? This, this won't work what's the yeah 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 because we when i read it there's a paradox condition and i thought that was rare somehow and when i as i misread the rules i'm sure but it happens a lot yeah that's how yeah. most of our games ended was yeah. maybe we were just noobs but it's very easy yeah. to get yourself in a paradox where you need a card that doesn't exist right right so, yeah, that, that was a cool experience. We had a lot of fun with that. Okay, man. Well, we've got great plans for 2024. Yeah, we're looking forward to sharing the, the, this coming year, the rest of the year with, with you all, listeners and viewers. And thanks so much again for taking time to, to tune in, to watch us. Um, it, is, it is such a gift and a privilege um, that you uh, share some of your time with us. And we, we really thank each of you. And 
And Kevin, thanks so much as always to you. It's I always enjoy getting to hang Same out with here. you. Same here, so. Daniel. Okay, have a fantastic biweekly life. What? Well, you, you too, except I forgot. How can people <gasps> contact us or find us? Carrier pigeons. Carrier pigeons. That's the game I'm working on. But yes, <laughs> that we're working on together. But yeah, so we can. What are other hey, ways? Because you like pick up pigeons? and delivery. That's perfect. That's, that's right. Of course, that's you right. want to carry your that's pigeon. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, uh, Board Game yep. Faith, and we are on Facebook, Board Game Faith. Just search for yep. us there, and you can boardgamefaith.com and email boardgamefaith at gmail dot com. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Carrier yep. pigeon and coordinates alpha gamma three by the old cow <laughs> four delta. <laughs> Epsilon. Because I bet it's been around a long time. Well, I know it's been around a long time, so I bet they use Greek letters. They, I, I think so. Yeah. I'm reading a book about carrier pigeons, but that's Aren't for you? the next time. We'll do it next time. For research? We'll talk about that next time. For your game? I just, that's right. Maybe. Maybe. And, and, um, and if you do uh, enjoy the podcast, if, if you happen to have time and moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, we'd appreciate that very much. We, we understand that that kind of trains the algorithms to recommend our podcast to other people. So we'd appreciate that too. If, if you feel so, so led. That's um, right. So anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. We'll see you all Peace. next time. <gasps> Bye.